It's your Locked On Flyers podcast for Monday, July 3rd. Your daily dose of Flyers news, analysis, and high-quality content that is intrigued by Danny Breer's choice of free agents to sign in Garnet Hathaway and Ryan Poiling. There's a lot there, for sure. Yeah, we are going to get into that, plus the start of Development Camp and our nemesis of the week, all on today's show. Your Locked On Flyers, your daily podcast on the Philadelphia Flyers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, thanks for making Locked On Flyers your first listen every day. I am Rachel Donner. You can find me on Twitter at rmiriam. I'm here as always with Russ Cohen, who's on Twitter at Sportsology. You can subscribe or follow us for free over on YouTube or on the SiriusXM app. Anywhere you listen to podcasts, you'll get our latest episode as soon as it's available here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Russ, Danny Briere said over and over again that free agency was going to be slow for the Flyers, but he did manage to make a few signings and, in fact, uh, had a press conference after the first one saying, yeah, we're pretty much done, you know, but then had two more signings immediately thereafter, which was kind of funny. Well, I mean, GMs never fully tell the truth. I know. So we know I that. I know. I mean, that's that's to be expected. Of course, I just thought it was like, oh, Danny Breyer is getting right on this train of being sly, even mm-hmm. though he's the new kid on the block. So I appreciated the subterfuge there. But uh, talking about the first signing in Ryan Paling, I actually really like this signing. I think, uh, you know, he's a, a decent bottom six depth signing, one year, 1.4 million, low risk not a huge cap hit and he's young. And that's something that Danny Breyer talked about. Um, he, you know, he's 24 has, um, you know, spent most of his time with the Habs where he was drafted, um, but was not given an offer by the pens this past year. And it's just kind of a guy that need needed an opportunity, um, but he can play the middle. He can give you some quality PK time. He brings speed. Um, I remember a bunch of his games with Laval uh, when we were watching him against the Phantoms, like really stood out to me a lot. And um, I, I think that this is a really good fit for where the Flyers are right now. He's a good fit if he's healthy. Like, I hope the Flyers did their due diligence because he's had a bunch of upper body injuries that have stalled mm-hmm. him. And so, like, if he plays a full season, he'll be good for them. Uh, can he play a full season? I'm not sure. So I get it's low risk for the money, uh, but it could be problematic if he's in and out of the lineup. So we're going to have to see uh, where he's at with that. But I like him on on the surface, sure. Yeah, I think that, you know, in terms of signing depth forwards, you know, and we'll get to the other one in Garnet Hathaway. But I think that all of us really expected if he was going to sign these depth forwards, they were all going to be older veterans, you know, with not much to prove that were just kind of filling a spot while this rebuild is happening. And this is a different kind of signing. And, Mm -hmm. and I like that, that, you know, again, it's a little risky given the injury history, but I think the, the payoff could be really good if he does stay healthy and he's one of those guys that um, Danny Breer really thinks will work well with John Tortorella because he's like a guy who's going to work hard and do what he's told and and all of that. So, you know, the timing versus the opportunity on both sides seems like a really good fit. Yeah, and he's got some speed and toughness and a little bit of scoring ability. Hopefully, you know, he'll be able to show that off. Yeah, I think so, too. Now, Garnet Hathaway, on the other hand, is, of course, a more traditional depth forward signing and uh you know he's he's older uh spent a good part of his career with the Washington Capitals and that's you know what I think of him as uh he was traded at the trade deadline to the Boston Bruins this past year uh, 22 points 13 goals 9 assists this past season and it, he got the kind of contract that um I think is a little pricey, but the kind of contract I would have expected for a guy like this. Uh, so it's two year, 4.75 million uh, contract. So it's a 2.375 million cap hit per year. And like two year contracts are the thing. But ag- again, you know, it does fit in, in into a rebuild timeline. You have a, a veteran depth forward for 
for two seasons. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Jordan Hall noted on Twitter that the opponent he has scored against the most is the Flyers, 11 points in his career. So glad to take him off the board on the other side of things. But uh, what's your take on this one? Well, you know, the Flyers did that once with Jody Shelley because he scored a lot <laughs> against them and it, and it didn't work out. I, I like Hathaway as a player. Uh, he could mm-hmm. get traded at one of the deadlines, but yep. he's going to take a spot from a youngster. And my problem is, if you're going to play him on the third line, he may not, but he's really not a third liner. And I think uh, even Tortorella would find that out. But if he plays on the fourth line, you've basically eliminated any chance for a young player to play on that fourth line this year. Yeah, that is where my concern was as well with this yeah. signing, that you know, with Paling, he's like a younger guy and can fit into sort of that prospect competition, looking toward the future thing. But with Hathaway, this this does take that roster spot away. And, and it had me thinking, like, why are we getting Garnet Hathaway when we have Nick Delorier in the lineup? And right. to me, that's a redundancy that um, if you didn't have that awful term on Delorier's contract and that likely makes it harder to trade, like I, I would love this signing. Like if, if Delorier just wasn't in the picture at all and didn't exist, I think this would be that perfect depth signing mm-hmm. to put in the lineup. But the problem is now we have two of them. <laughs> and and to your point, it does take away that roster spot from, you know, a, a younger guy. Yeah, they and, and Paling's got okay speed, but, you know, one of the edicts of this team was to get bigger faster. They got bigger. They didn't get faster. So I think that, you know, this is I, – I think it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out, especially with Tortorella and what he is expecting out of these guys this season um, and where these two could end up in the lineup. I certainly don't want anybody boxed out. But, you know, I looked at, like at the Allison. lineup – yeah. Yeah. I mean, what what does that mean for mean for Wade Allison? Um, you know, what does it mean for Tanner Lazinski? Uh, those are just all big questions. And then, um, you know, looking at the cap hits, you know, that leaves a, you know, a certain amount of money left over. Um, I think it's around in the six point five million dollar range where the Flyers are right now to sign Noah Cates, Morgan Frost, and Cam York, essentially, he, like that have to fit into that dollar value. Yeah, see, I would have done it a little differently. Instead of Hathaway, I would have gotten a defenseman. Yeah. Uh, that's just me, but they didn't no, do it. That's the next part of this conversation, right, is that they signed two forwards and not a defenseman. Now, Part of me is thinking that Breer feels like he has to wait until the D'Angelo situation plays itself out before he can sign a defenseman or not. But by waiting that long, it's risky that, you know, the defensemen that he may want to sign in lieu of Tony D'Angelo are going to be off the board. Plus, you don't know how the money's all going to shake out until July 8th. Like, yep. and, and that's only if you have those other guys signed by July 8th. So. Yeah, but right now, if you look at the Flyers roster and the 23 positions, the only open spot is a seventh defenseman. Everything else is filled, and that eliminates uh, players like Elliot Denoye, Ali Lixel, Bobby Brink, J.R. Avon, Tanner Lazinski. Um, you know, those are the forwards that are currently boxed out. You know, you can have Tyson Forster in there, but... yeah. But everybody else is kind of boxed out. And I do want to eliminate the um, thought that, well, you know, there could be a competition and the young guy could win out. They're not going to sit Hathaway at that money. He's not sitting. Right. Correct. So, again, I think, you know, in a vacuum, I think it's a really solid signing. And I think Mm -hmm. it's really smart um, in terms of the kind of player, like the players that they signed have skill. And yes. are useful players. Um, so I, I don't disagree with these signings on principle. I think it's just in the context, you have to look at it and say, what does that do for prospect development here? Yeah. I mean, I think this is where John Tortorella wins out. Yeah, I think it, it does to some degree. But, um, you know, uh, there's one more signing we have to talk about. We're going to talk about what Danny Breer had to say in that um, interim press conference, plus talk about DevCamp. We're going to get to all of that.
coming up next. Take your first swing at betting MLB on FanDuel and get 10 times your first bet in bonus bets up to $200. That's right. Just 20, just bet 20 bucks and you'll land $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. That's 200. You could spend betting everything from the money line to the over under to who you think is going to come out, going to hit the first home run. It's all on the app. That's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Plus, when you win, you can get paid instantly. There's no better place to bet on MLB than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So sign up today and visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get up to $200 in bonus bets. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Before we dig in to uh, the rest of the free agency and dev camp discussion, I uh, just want to say thanks once again for subscribing over on YouTube. We hit Thank that 1,000 uh, subscriber mark, which is such a huge milestone for us. We appreciate it. Thanks for coming along with the ride of uh, this draft and free agency. And we'll have more uh, really good content over the summer heading into next season. So we have our last giveaway that we are doing as a thank you. And as we teased, there's going to be two items in this one. So there'll be a post as per usual over on YouTube for you to comment on. Uh, we will be giving away a Claude Giroux uh, autographed photo that is framed and a Travis Konechny rookie materials card. So this is a big one, y'all. Uh, everybody out there should comment and give yourself a chance to win. Uh, the question we will have you answer is which line will Garnet Hathaway play on the third or the fourth? So comment with your answer. Um, we will pick a winner later this week. Uh, looking at our last question that we did uh, in terms of which player, current player on the Flyers you'd want to keep, Carter Hart was the overwhelming winner uh, on that one with Owen Tippett in second place, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, a look to the future, I'd say. Yeah, no doubt. Fans like him, and I get it. Yeah. All right. Uh, one more small free agent signing for the Flyers in Rhett Gardner. Uh, it's a two-way contract. Um, Actually, a really solid center with the Texas Stars in the AHL from this past season. Um, 10 goals, 30 assists in 71 games. A little bit high on the penalty scale, but oh, yeah. it's the AHL, so we'll we'll give that asterisk to it. But yeah, he was a plus 26 as well. So a, a real solid addition for the Phantoms, I'd say. Yeah, he's definitely going to help them. Uh, he brings a little gusto, some scoring, a little bit of a playmaker. Not a bad player at all. Yeah. Uh, looking at what Danny Breer had to say uh, at his free agency press conference, again, before the Garnet Hathaway <laughs> signing happened, um, you know, he did comment on the defensive side of things that we were talking about in the last segment. Um, it's interesting because on the forward side, he absolutely did something that could potentially block prospect development, but he spoke about how this was very key on the defensive side of things, uh, which is why he hadn't signed anybody as of yet and uh, mentioned that, you know, Walker and Risto could get looks with Cam York, but they really think that Emil Andre and Igor Zamula could potentially move up. Yeah, I don't think if Andre can move up yet. I think that's, no. that's too soon. I wouldn't want him to. He hasn't played North America enough. Zamula yeah, I think that's maybe. a later in the season thing. Yeah. Zamula maybe, but again, the only thing that I think that that Danny could be having trouble with is it's harder to break in on defense. It just yeah. is. It's easier to push in a forward. Uh, you saw Wade Allison was pretty easy to plug in last year. So I think Zamula's close and he might be able to be that guy, but the coach is very demanding on his defensemen. And so that's a worry for me. Yeah, I, I think so as well. Um, you know, we mentioned the Tony D'Angelo situation. It was funny because Pierre had said, you know, was sort of cagey about it and said, you know, there, this this is a deal that um, we have to wait and see. And then later in the day, Don Waddell from McCain said, oh, yeah, the deal's on. We just got to wait for the date. I know. So funny. And he did. 
actually the right thing. He and did. For some reason, Don wanted to maybe pump his fan base, but but Danny played that right. Yeah, it's uh, it is kind of funny. And then um, he was asked about Sean Couturier. So far, so good. Uh, you know, I don't know what else he was going to say no, on that front, but um, I think that you know the other big part of it was it it confirmed that Travis Sanheim is going nowhere. Right. Which I think after a while we all knew, so that's fine. Uh, you just hope he gets better. That's all. So uh, he did also talk about Dev Camp, which started yesterday, and that he's uh, really excited about this one in particular uh, because it, it's his opportunity to get to know some of these players, and that um, for this one, this is kind of the new player development group that is leading it. So we have Riley Armstrong and Nick Schultz are, are heading this up. And so it'll give all of us a chance to see how they run a development camp. And I think that's really some of the most important aspects of it for me. Yeah, no question. We'll see uh, what changes we see in front of the scenes. I'm more interested in behind the scenes, but that will take a while to, to sort of find out about. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think there was any surprises per se on the invite list. Uh, we knew that Cutter Gautier wasn't going to be there and yeah, that I Matt Bay Mitchkoff wasn't going to be there either. No. But all the other draft picks are present. Of course, uh, we learned at the draft that Ryan McPherson's brother Connor was going to be invited and yeah. you know, he was on the list. I mean, so, someone asked about Tuomala too. He may be in camp, like he, you know, or camp yeah. was starting this week. Very possible. Yeah. So I think that's part of the the discussion there. And then there were three goaltenders invited to camp along with Carson Bjarnason, the draft pick. But obviously all eyes are going to be on Carson as far as goaltending. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's no question. But it, it's nice to have uh, a top-level goalie in camp again. Yeah. I think it, that's that's a lot of fun. That isn't Carter Hart. I feel like that's the right. last time we had that. Well, Urson so. won the award. He was pretty good. Okay, I'll, I'll give him that. Yeah, but yeah, I think uh, so. I think Dev Camp should be really fun. Uh, the two of us are going to try to attend as well and give you some reports direct from that. So stay tuned uh, for for all of that content coming later this week. Uh, just in talking about free agency across the league, it was expected to be kind of a not exciting free agency per se. And I would say it was a little more exciting than expected. Um, a lot of signings, a lot of interesting signings, um, you know, talking about Garnet Hathaway as a signing that you could potentially flip at the deadline. Uh, the Yotes did that, I think, uh, pretty well. The signing Jason Zucker. I have no doubt yeah. they're going to try and flip him at the deadline. Yeah. And Zucker's, you know, from the Vegas area. So his parents can play. That's fine. I mean, I, I have no problem with that. There were some bad deals, though, like some really the Alex Cole yeah. deal was terrible with Anaheim. I, I I don't know what they're thinking. I get you want to bring in a winner. OK, um, I don't think I could have paid Max Pacioretty two million, but it wasn't horrible. But I based on his injury history and coming off a, an Achilles now, I don't know. That's that's tough. Honestly, though, as bad as the Kalorn one is, I think the worst deal of the day was for Corpus Solo. <laughs> five years, 20 million. He has been so up and down. Honestly, the, the Senators have not done anything good in net deal wise since Pierre Dorian was there. Like that's his weakness. Yeah, I think that the term was what got me yes. with that, just because of the risk of of his capabilities. Um, yes, and you know there was definitely a lot of short term deals because the cap didn't go up a lot. Um, but the sense just kind of threw that out the window with that deal, which was interesting to me. They did. I mean, the Sabres overpaid for Clifton, but he's good, so that's fine. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Milan Lucic back to Boston. I don't know why. Was it really three years? Did they really sign him for three years? Yeah, they did. That's crazy. Like that's unless he's going to be a coach, he's not. He's not playing out that contract. Um, you know, I thought the Leafs were very uh interesting with the new regime there ryan reeves a three-year deal i mean yeah and then the klingberg deal like getting klingberg was good but the deal itself was not good no deal was not good uh as many advanced 
analytics people pointed out, his defense has gotten worse. So they're going to have to put him with somebody really good. And the Leafs have lost a lot on offense. So mm-hmm. we'll see what, what they do to make it up. But this doesn't help them as a defensive unit. It may help them offensively, but it didn't love it. Um, you know, the Rangers got older. The, the Blake Wheeler was a no-brainer. Yeah. I don't, I don't mind the quick only because it's like, okay, for 25, 27 games, that's fine. But these other signings just block all their young players. So they really, for the you know, for everything they were trying to do two years ago, they have really slipped back into, well, we'll just bring in veterans and hope for the best. I know. That, that honestly was the most perplexing team activity of yes. the day to me, just because – um, you know, bringing in Blake Wheeler, but then you have Eric Gustafson, Nick Benino, Riley Nash. Like, what are we doing here? I mean, Tyler remember Pickett, Laviolette like, likes Gustafson, unfortunately. I know. And, I know. And, and there's just a, there's an offensive side there, and that's it. And there's a, a cap on that now. And so it's like, you know, you're, you got other guys there that are, are going to be blocked. But that's what happens when you go, like, when you start changing coaches a lot. Uh, yeah. Your plan for your team can change a lot. Morgan Geeky to the Bruins was a good sneaky move. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's really good. Connor Brown to the Oilers, so he could play with Connor McDavid again. He may never be on his line, but he might be on the same power play they played together in Erie back in the day when I went and go saw to go see Connor McDavid. I watched both of them play together. So that's a reunited, um, also reunited Jonathan Duran and Patrick and Nathan McKinnon. That hasn't happened in a long time like yeah you know i saw them together a long time ago and we haven't seen it since so it could be a good thing yeah i I think the other interesting team for me was nashville yes in signing ryan o'reilly luke shen and gustav nyquist and but then also cody glass like it it was like the ryan o'reilly deal was was good luke shen is serviceable right but mm-hmm. and he got a good con- like I know no, he was a- never getting a better deal than that. No, no. But then like to add Matt Duchesne. Oh, and sorry, Matt Duchesne cleared waivers for them. Yeah. But but to add Gustav Nyquist and and Cody Glass, I think was sort of the questionable side of it for me. Well, not for me in the sense that Glass could learn from O'Reilly, and I think they do look at him as a future piece. Uh, unfortunately, I think they're maybe two steps ahead of what the Flyers were a year ago. Like if these mm-hmm. moves don't work out in two years, they're rebuilding. Right. Like they just are. Yeah. That's what it felt like to me. It was like an aggressive retool situation. Yes. <laughs> so they better hope this one works because otherwise they're going to end up going in the other direction at some point. Yeah. Especially because Ryan O'Reilly is 32 and his yes. contract, he'll be 36 when his contract is over. No, so he's I not playing know. out that contract. No. So I don't know what's going on there, but all, all of it was interesting. Um, Coming up next, we are going to name our nemesis of the week and talk about the former Flyers and where they wound up in free agency so far. So just want to make clear, we haven't mentioned, uh, we are recording this on Sunday morning, so should any other big signings happen or like with the Flyers or elsewhere, we'll talk about it on a future show. But uh, looking at the former Flyers out there, JVR got a one-year deal in Boston. uh, for One billion dollars, that's it. I know, but I think like for him at this point in his career where he's made the money, he had the big contract, this is a chance to win for him and be on a solid team and be able to contribute. Yeah, I don't know if they're going to be a winning team, but he's going to have to prove himself because he's you know, this he, he's not going to be in the league long if he continues this downward trend. Yeah. And then uh, Shane Gossespierre wound up in Detroit. I think that's actually a pretty good fit for him. I think he'll be able to get the kind of playing time that he wants and be a leader on their team as as far as the blue line goes. Um, And they do have solid defensemen on that team so that they'll be a good partner option for him in terms of picking up the defensive side of things. I don't know if he'll get the same point total there, though, because... They do want to play oh, it's more different def- than, yeah, it's than different. Arizona. He's for not sure. going to get all that opportunity. So we'll see. But he's this is where the 40 point defensemen who don't play much defense are at. They get signed to one year deals. They get like between two and four million and some get resigned and some don't. Yeah. Uh, one of the other interesting things, uh, Rako Gudis uh, signed with the Ducks. And I love that he and Alex Kalorn are now on the same team when they were on the <laughs> opposite sides of the Florida rivalry. 
<laughs> this past season. So that'll be a fun little narrative. Yeah, Racco cashed in, cashed in for sure. Yeah, he did. Um, you know, as we we know, like Nolan Patrick didn't receive a qualifying offer and he's still out there. Isaac Radcliffe didn't get an offer with Nashville. Which is a shame. Um, I hope he catches yeah. on with somebody because I still don't feel good about how that all went down for him. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, Jay O'Brien is actually really interesting because it was uh, reported that he was going to get an invite to the Penns development camp, obviously. Um, you know, that would be kind of odd, but a thing that can happen. And, uh, but he wasn't on the list when it came out. Could be so, sick. Could be a whole yeah. bunch of things. Yeah. And then uh, Troy Grosinick, um, the goaltender that had been partially with the Phantoms this past year, he signed in the Preds organization okay. as well. That's good for him. So a lot of, a lot of ex flyers getting new homes this season. Uh, turning to our nemesis of the week. Last week, we talked a little bit about the NHL schedule getting back to normal. So we had the draft and went straight into free agency with maybe like 18 hours of downtime. That's it. And some people between- some people got stuck in Nashville, so they I don't even know if they got back in time to enjoy the 18 hours. I know. It was, it was, it was pretty uh, nuts. I was and- lucky. And yeah, and, and free agency, like I said, was a lot more active than we thought it might have been. So it, it's been a busy week, Russ. It has. It really has. So turning to the nemesis for this week, I think for me, it's just waiting on that Tony D'Angelo trade. Like, is it going to happen? And what does that mean for the Flyers blue line? What does it mean for the cap situation in terms of the remaining contracts that the Flyers have to sign? We talked about earlier, and that is, that is the thing I am nervous about. Yeah, my my nemesis is the airlines. I mean, too many people got stranded in Nashville from that draft. Uh, Even going to the draft, people really got in trouble in Newark. And a lot of people just couldn't make the draft, even if they had tickets, even if they had hotels, even if so. The airlines have really been bad for this whole time. And it makes it hard to travel now. I mean, we've talked about having to be there a day before whatever it is you want to do. And even that wasn't good for some enough for some people. And so I feel bad for those that were affected. It really it was a big deal. Yeah, it it, it has been quite a nightmare with travel. I think I'm going to stick to trains yep. from, from now on, <laughs> see if they can get me where I need to go. Uh, a little Flyers fun thing before we go today, um, as Dev Camp has begun, uh, of course, they try and use it as an opportunity to market some of the newer players. So first round draft pick Oliver Bonk threw out the first pitch at a Phillies game, um, got a custom jersey and everything. I love when they do stuff like that. I do, too. Um, it wasn't the worst pitch. It wasn't great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was like was I wasn't going to critique the pitch. No, <laughs> I always do. Sorry. If you're going to throw out a first pitch, no matter who you are. You could be an 80-year-old grandfather or, a, a, you know, a young prospect. I'm going to critique it. So that's just yeah, All right. Well, remind me never to throw out the first pitch I, in a baseball game. I Listen, it's a lot of pressure. It is. It is. All right. That will do it for today's show. Uh, every day or tomorrow on the show, we are going to do a – a development camp report with some on scene reporting on that as well. As a reminder, we always want to hear from you. We are going to do a full mailbag episode this week. So send in your questions on the new signees, the new draft picks. Uh, you can tweet us at Lockdown Flyers for as long as Twitter is usable. Uh, ah. You can e- email us at Lockdown Flyers at Gmail or comment over on YouTube. I'm Rachel. I'm on Twitter at R Miriam. That's R M I R I A M. I'm Russ at Sportsology, S P O R T S O L O G Y. Have a great day, everyone.